Hello and welcome to the final day of Virtually 2024. Uh, this is an immense free virtual web accessibility and digital inclusion conference and happy Global Accessibility Awareness Day as well. I'm Mary, I'm your host for today, and I'm delighted to introduce you to some of the leading thinkers in accessibility and inclusive design. Today's talks have some great actionable insights, which I really hope will inspire you to take them back into your day to day role, no matter where you're joining from. And we are thrilled to have people watching from all over the world spreading that message even further. A tiny bit of housekeeping before we start, we are very grateful to MyClearText who are providing our live captions. You can access these by clicking on the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom window, or alternatively, we have provided a stream text link in the chat for a fully adjustable page of captions as well. All sessions will be recorded and will be available publicly online shortly after the conference. So, as to our speakers, first up today, we have Nomensa's own Lauren Ellis and Hannah Atkinson, two of our incredible principal content designers. We know that content is a significant part of meeting WCAG standards, but they'll talk us how to go further and make your content even more inclusive. Going beyond the checklist, they'll share knowledge and tips so you can talk to more marginalized users in a way that resonates with them. So tap into your empathy for today's session. Please do get involved in the discussion in the chat and let us know where you're watching from. Just make sure your chat settings are turned to everyone and not just panelist and host so that everybody can see your messages. And please submit any questions you might have as we go along for Lauren and Hannah using the Q&A box. I'll try to get through as many as I can at the end. This session will be recorded and we'll be sending out videos of all of the talks from this week as soon as they're ready shortly after the event. That's probably enough of me. So I will hand you over to Hannah and Lauren. Oh, hiya. Good morning. Um, yes, as Mary said, we'll be talking about including all. So we'll be talking about how we can use language to go beyond the WACAG guidelines. Um, we know that inclusive language is ever evolving and that's really exciting, but it can be quite challenging to keep up with what's going on. And um, so we're hoping today we can offer some insight that might help you on your way. And while we're not necessarily complete experts in this field, we have got a lot of both lived and professional um, experiences working across a range of clients for the private sector, public sector, different charities. So we really want this um, this presentation to be a collection of resources, tips and lessons that we've learned along the way. And also um, we're still learning as well with this, as Hannah just said, it's constantly evolving, constantly changing, and there's always new and better ways of just writing so we'd like the session to be a bit of an open dialogue, so feel free to share, challenge us kindly and ask any questions that you might want to. But um, before we get into it, we'll just do a little bit of a kind of intro of who Hannah and I are. I'm Hannah. Um, I'm a principal content designer at Nomensa. Um, the image on this slide shows a selfie of me, a white woman with red hair smiling at the top of Brandon Hill, which is in Bristol, um, on a sunny day, and I'm wearing a white Adidas top. Um, I've been with Nomensa for just over a year, mostly working on public sector projects, um, and I'm part of our ED&I team and our ethical UX working group. Um, most of my career has been in the women's not-for-profit sector, um, so for girl guiding, women's aid and the Fawcett Society, uh, where I've worked across product and content. Um, I actually started out in digital marketing for a book publisher where I once mopped the sweat off Kerry Katona's forehead and I taught Kate Moss how to tweet. Um, so that was fun. Hi, so um, I'm Lauren. I'm also a principal content designer at Nomensa. Um, the image you see on screen is of me on holiday in Rome. I think I probably had a couple glasses of limoncello at this point. So um, I'm a it's uh, I'm a white blonde woman wearing a denim jacket and I'm holding a camera, big old smile, staring over um, the river that I don't know the name of in Rome. I probably should know. Um, so similar to Hannah, I started my career in content marketing, but um, I don't actually have any funny celebrity anecdotes, but um, I did spend a year when I first started writing, writing probably about 20 or so blogs a month for this um, Indian food restaurant chain. Um, these weren't published anywhere, though, as far as I can tell. So I don't really know what happened to the tens of thousands of words I ended up writing for this company um anyway so um, I moved into UX in about 2018 and since then I've been working with um clients across the private public sector and a few charities as well so what we're we going to be talking about today 
Um, today we're going to cover what we mean by going beyond WACAG, what does that actually mean, um, who we're talking about when we're talking about being inclusive, some looking inwards at ourselves and our team, looking outwards, so thinking about our research and how we find out about our users, um, and then we'll move on to more practical tips. So we've got um, a little bit about our approach to um, inclusive content design, and then some practical tips on how you could potentially work more inclusively. So as probably everyone on the call knows today and after all the great speaks and um, great talks had over the last two days or so, um, the web content accessibility, accessibility guidelines lay a really good foundation for creating accessible websites. But if your content isn't inclusive in terms of language or even topics covered, all that hard work can go to waste. So today we're gonna to be talking about how you can build on that good work and continue doing something that's gonna create inclusive content. And hopefully as well, we'll show you that inclusive language doesn't have to be this like big scary topic that you have to kind of tiptoe around or something that is gonna limit you creati um, creatively. Just as accessible design doesn't equal boring design, inclusive language doesn't have to be these kind of like strict guardrails you push up against, they can be a creative challenge that forces you to think bigger about the way that you're approaching problems and also it's just the right thing to do so firstly so what we what do we mean when we say about going beyond WACAG so um as everyone knows um WACAG is basically helps us to make sure that websites and products are more accessible for disabled people however you can meet all those guidelines and still not be inclusive um, due to the language used and topics covered so an example of this could be a music venue whose website is technically accessible but if its content doesn't actually mention things like wheelchair access it isn't inclusive um, by writing in an inclusive way we can support um, not only more users but fulfill more of their user needs and this is because inclusive design also factors in things like our users' age, location, economic status, race, gender, language, literacy, as well as things like tech confidence. So, and also um, if we do it right as well, we can also bring in people's emotional states as well, which just kind of brings our writing to the next level. And to kind of put it a different way, because we love a, love a graphic, so accessible is usable, whereas inclusive is designed for as many people as possible. And yeah, it goes beyond just not discriminating, discriminating against people, and removing barriers, but actively seeks to include more people. Um, so to talk a little bit about the distinctions we're making here and who and what we're talking about when we're thinking about inclusion, I'm just going to go through a couple of terms that might help. Um, so firstly, protected characteristics and discrimination. Protected characteristics are covered in law. So if someone discriminates you, you against you because of one of these characteristics, you are in theory protected by the law and you could seek to take legal action. For example, you're pregnant and you don't get a promotion that your non-pregnant colleague does. Um, or if you got refused a double room at a hotel because you're a gay couple, for example, you could take action against that hotel. And there are loads of different types of discrimination from unfair work practices to hate crimes. Um, discrimination is very real and many people have, who have protected characteristics experience it regularly. For example, in the United States, 42% of employees have experienced or witnessed racism at work, which is wild. Um, and between 11 and 28% of lesbian, gay and bisexual employees have lost a promotion due to their sexual orientation. But what we're talking about today uh, is more to do with marginalization and social exclusion. So having certain protected characteristics might mean you're part of a group um, often referred to as a marginalized group. For example, if uh, your gender reassignment or your sexual orientation might make you part of a group that people call queer people or LGBTQ plus people. Um, you might also be marginalized without having one of these characteristics. So for example, if you have a low socioeconomic status or a bigger body size, um, and there are lots of ways that people experience marginalization in their day-to-day -day lives that don't equate to what the law sees as discrimination. Um, you could think of it as having your needs pushed to one side or living in a world which just isn't designed for you. Um, a good example of this might be uh, female crash test dummies, which weren't a thing until 2011, um, meaning that before that car and car safety was designed to protect men's bodies. They're still really under-tested 
um, with women still more likely to die or suffer serious injury in a car crash because of this, which is quite heavy news to deliver on a Thursday morning. But it just is quite a clear demonstration of, of what happens when certain groups aren't thought about. Um, there's also countless examples of the white default. Um, so things that have been designed with and for only white people in mind. Um, there were soap dispensers that don't dispense soap for black skin. Um, there's much higher rates of misdiagnosing skin cancer in people of colour because popular medical textbooks have 600 diagrams of white skin and only 10 of black or brown skin. Um, another example is IVF treatment. So having a baby if you're a lesbian is a total postcode lottery. Many same-sex couples have to self-fund at least six cycles of IUI before they're eligible for NHS IVF treatment, making it totally out of reach financially for lots of couples. Um, lots of couples actually do crowdfunders and things like that to support them having a baby, and heterosexual couples don't have to do this. Um, an example of being marginalised in cases where protected characteristics aren't in place uh, might be things like shops not accepting cash when you have a cash in hand job or clothes shops not stocking your size or services being entirely online. So you might not be discriminating, but you could be marginalising by not including people. Um, marginalised people face barriers in all sorts of areas of their life that can disempower them and prevent them from accessing services that are supposed to be for everyone. Um, and some examples of this in our line of work. Um, I did a, a search on a makeup retailer's website for foundation and the results page, um, nearly all of them were for white skin. Um, all emojis were white until 2015. Um, nearly all online stores categorise their clothing into two genders. Um, there's an image here on this slide of a form that I found on a cinema's uh, loyalty scheme sign up. Um, and the gender question is not great. Um, if you don't uh, identify as male or female, this is not a great option. Um, and regardless, I'm not really sure why they're asking me for my gender for this. Um, and then the other image on this page is of a yellow poster with a hashtag I am not a typo campaign. And it's got lots of people's names with um, some of them with the red dotted autocorrect line underneath. Um, and this is a recent campaign you might have seen um, trying to highlight that autocorrect is very uh, white centric and it often ignores names of African, Asian origin and gives them that little red dotted line, which is quite a good, good example of um, people having to digitally assimilate. So they're adjusting their behaviours, for example, adding their name to the dictionary, uh, which is a step that white people don't have to take. Um, yes. So what can we do? Well, we can start by looking inwards. So the first thing to do, oh, sorry, the good news is it starts with us. Um, yeah, it starts with our work um, the products we're creating, the businesses we work for and the communities we're part of. Um, and a great place to start is looking at your team. So if your team isn't diverse, you probably need to go further to look at other outlooks. When we're thinking about those examples that I just went through, it can feel like there's been a huge omission in the design process. And often it comes down to omissions in the team or in decision-making positions. We're all unconsciously biased towards what we need and what we like. And we can forget to think about the people who are different from us. Um, and it's not gonna fix everything. Marginalization is a really complex social problem, but having more representation in the room undoubtedly leads to products designed for a wider range of people. Um, we know that people hire in their own image, so maybe have a think about what you can do to buck this trend. And I, I can't go into loads of details now about how to make your hiring practices more inclusive, but there are loads of resources online that could help you. Um, and if you are doing that, make sure it's not tokenistic. If you have those people in the room, then make sure you're listening to those voices and really considering what having a diverse team means and what it can bring to your practice. Um, 
And maybe you know that your team isn't diverse, but right now hiring more people is just not an option. If that's the case, you're going to need to work harder to consider who isn't in the room and really think about that and find out what their needs are. And we'll come on to this a little bit later. Um, I'm just going to read out the quotes that are on this slide. Um, one is from Candy Williams, who's the head of content at Bumble and one of my personal content heroes. Um, and she says, if there was ever an industry where we need inclusive teams, it's in user experience. We have a responsibility for designing products and services that people from all walks of life rely on. How can we do that if our own teams and the people we research aren't representative? And we also have Mike Montero, who wrote Ruined by Design. The problem is that when your team all have roughly the same experience, you end up building the tool that works for that team and you've marginalized everyone else. The second thing you can do is take a look at yourself. Um, there's lots of common ableist and racist phrases that are used in everyday life. Um, and sometimes they're so ingrained that they can seem very far from their original context. Some examples that I hear regularly are Chinese whispers, which stems from a racist idea in the 1800s that Chinese people spoke in a way that was deliberately unintelligible. Um, similarly, no can do and long time no see have origins in the mocking of Chinese immigrants and indigenous Americans using pidgin English. These terms are kind of debated in their offensiveness, but it's worth checking in and forming your own opinion if you feel comfortable using them. And it's not just those phrases, there's tons and no one is expecting you to know the etymology of all language, but it's just a note to, to check in with yourself and keep thinking about those things. Um, some other examples are, uh, what's your spirit animal? It was a question on a popular dating app until recently as a conversation starter, but it trivializes an important part of indigenous culture. Um, people use gendered terms all the time, like saying, hey guys, um, which some people don't mind, but some people really do. Um, and there's also quite a lot of what can be quite damaging mental health language. So words like crazy or psycho can be really triggering for people. Um, some examples I've used unknowingly recently was saying that something was lame and my partner highlighted that that wasn't okay to say. Um, I also said falling on deaf ears to a colleague really recently and there are much better ways for express, to express myself um, and, and to say that I didn't feel listened to. Um, and that's just me saying it happens to everyone. So don't beat yourself up about it if you say these things, but just try and learn from it and move on and be better in future. So um, once you've had a look at the organisation you work with, try and um, improve like, your hiring practices and also just kind of checking in with yourself. Um, if there are things you can't do and can't change about um, either the project you're on or yeah, because like, you don't always have like resources to be able to um, like hire more people at a certain point, the best way to kind of counteract that is to um, start looking at like the designs we're creating, the products we produce and the services we deliver. And the best way to test all of those things is by doing research. So whether it's a new design project, internal process or an entirely new service, if you want to make it inclusive, it's really important that you do a lot of research. So research is something that's going to really help you to um, like just reveal what's actually needed and it can inform your writing in lots of ways. So it can show you things like who your users are and how they identify. And um, this means that users can actually guide how they're referred to and spoken about, as well as the kind of like topics you include. You'll also learn what's important to them. And then you can craft your language and prioritize certain bits of information over others or kind of um, ignore others altogether. And also you can learn how they actually want to access a service. So for some people, they only want to do things through um, like paper-based processes, speaking to a person on the phone. Some people prefer doing tasks online. Then there's something that's come up in the talks over the last two days as well, which is just that we're kind of digitizing everything, but that doesn't actually suit a lot of people. So by speaking to your um, users, you can really understand how they want to kind of access the service you're working for. So um, testing content is um, a way to ensure that it's both informative and reflective of users' lived experiences and needs, and it can show you how it how well it's actually working. But as well as testing for things like comprehension, usability, and accessibility, you, you can test for inclusion as well. So you can ask like a mixture of like closed questions and then open questions. So some closed questions include things like, does this content give you all the information that you need? Um, is this content in the right format? Or would you need somebody else to come in and help you to complete this task? 
Um, and are we referring to in a way that feels kind of accurate and dignified? The closed questions are a bit more yes or no. So if you want to get a little bit more context, it's good to ask those open questions. So these could be things like, what would you need to feel supported at this point? Um, how does this content make you feel? Like, could you describe how the words make you feel? And um, if there was something like, what would you change about this kind of piece of content, this service, this product to make it more tailored to you and your needs? And it'll also show you some kind of like unknown or unseen challenges that your users may face. Yes, we don't know what we don't know, which is why we do research. Um, but if you're missing out certain groups, then you might miss huge things that could really change the experience for people. Um, I did some very unscientific, poor practice research. So please don't at me if you're a researcher. Um, but I, so I run an, a queer hiking group in Bristol. Uh, we've got about 2000 followers on Instagram. And then I also have my own personal Instagram. Um, so I asked people in both of those followings uh, what the first thing they did when looking at holidays was via Instagram stories. So the images on this slide show those two stories um, asking the question, when picking, where to go on holiday, what's the first thing you do? Um, and you might be able to guess what half the LGBT community said, um, but if not, I'm about to tell you. Um, half the participants said that they look at the safety of the country first. Um, so the image on this slide shows screenshots of the answers from people who responded where nine out of 18 mentioned the safety. Laws vary and there's still 64 countries in the world that criminalize homosexuality, which is about a third of all countries. Um, some of these carry the death penalty or a hefty prison sentence and include popular holiday destinations like Jamaica, the Maldives, Malaysia, Morocco, and Sri Lanka. Um, there's only 34 countries in the world that have legalized same-sex marriage, which you'll know is significantly less than the number that criminalize. Um, and some such as Slovenia, Switzerland and Austria only legalized in the last few years. Um, and just because homosexuality is legal in a country, it doesn't mean it's widely accepted or understood or even safe. So uh, there's still a huge insecurity in many places that can leave queer people at risk of harm. Um, I asked the same question to my following. Uh, so in comparison, zero heterosexual people who responded mentioned personal safety as the first thing that they do. Um, the image on this slide shows screenshots of the answers from people who responded. Um, I'd also make a guess that people of color or women traveling alone or disabled people would also research a country's attitudes and access provision for their needs when thinking about going on holiday. So this is just an example of showing how diverse research can help you think about things you might not think about. For example, this could help you with the UX of a travel website or service, uh, maybe having a filter for safe countries for these groups of people or access provision for disabled people. Um, Airbnb, for example, already give hosts an option to make it very clear that they're queer friendly. And just some more general tips on research. Uh, research with a ride, as wide a range of participants as possible. Um, you can be very specific when you're asking for diversity in your pool. So ask for what you're needing, ask, ask for the people that you don't know enough about, um, and which we know can be challenging sometimes. Um, if you're on a project that needs very specific things or has quite a niche ask, uh, for example, I'm working on a project um, that is about planning permission, which can get very niche and the participant pool is already very small. Um, but we still try and push for it where we can um, because it's important to at least try. Um, it's especially important if the team working on the project are not diverse um, because you will have those gaps that we talked about earlier. Um, if you have a very small sample, remember that one person from a marginalized group does not represent all. Um, so it's important insight, but it doesn't mean that that's how everyone in that group of pe people thinks. Um, and if you are using specific marginalized groups for your research, you should always aim to compensate them for their time. Asking people to share often painful lived experience for free is not good practice. Um, but what can you do if you don't have any budgets, um, which I know is a very common problem um, or it could be that your stakeholders don't think it's important or you just don't have the researchers, the 
resources to do research. Um, so there's a few ideas that we have that you could use to try and help you understand your users better. Um, the first one is to speak to the experts. There are lots of specialist organizations and activists who can help you. Um, it's really okay not to know. Um, these people, uh, their whole job is knowing these things. So lean on their expertise. Um, for example, Stonewall are a great resource for LGBTQ stuff. Um, Scope are really great for disability. Age UK for older people. Um, charities are generally a really great place to start and they often have lots of resources on their websites that can help you. Um, and then we can also use online tools like SEMrush or Google Analytics. These can show you what search terms people are using or the challenges they might be facing or anxieties they have by the questions that they're asking. Um, if you don't know how to use Google Analytics, there's tons of uh, YouTube videos that can help you do some very basic things that you might find really useful. Um, another thing you can do is ask for feedback within your product or service. So you've designed a thing, you've missed all these steps, but you can, it's not too late to ask. Um, you can include a form or a component or even just a contact email on the page um, so people can get in touch with you and potentially tell you where you can improve. Um, another thing that you can do is we advise any way to let people write their own answers to questions if you're using a form. Um, by allowing people to answer in their own words, um, they can decide for themselves rather than having choices uh, dictated for them. So an example could be what title they use. Um, and this is also great because it will give you really good insight into the expressions that people use, which you could then analyse and group and use to improve a service going forward. So how do you then begin to approach the writing itself? So um, inclusive content does begin with the words, but it's about a lot more than just copy. Um, it's a way of like designing and thinking about problems. And while research is there to kind of like inform and shape your writing to begin with, it's also important to include um, like inclusive thinking in the way that you're making decisions and especially around like your language choices as well. So we're going to go a little bit into that into this next section. Um, because ultimately we are kind of conduits for our users and we need to be writing with them, not for them. So there really needs to be um, a bit of a partnership going on there. And we could do this by researching often, gathering feedback and just really trying to build like services or products around the people who are actually going to be using them. Um, as we spoke about a little bit just then, if you can reach out to charities, for instance, um, for contacts that you may have like within your sector. So um, last year I was working on a web website project that was the website content was basically dedicated to um, people who had either been like the victim or a witness of a crime. And they were looking for information about the court process. It was really hard to find participants for like such a niche group. But the organization we were working with had charities that were kind of working in partnership with them. So we were then able to kind of tap into that pool and bring them into our research sessions. Um, you can also use tactics like paired writing. So that's where you basically sit alongside a subject matter expert and write stuff together. Um, we quite often think of SMEs as like senior stakeholders or experts or product owners, but SMEs can also be service users, especially depending on the product that you're working with. So you're just bringing as many people to the, to the table as possible, just make um, the writing a lot better. And doing this is just gonna help you to ensure that your content is really reflective of people's lived experiences. And um, this is quite an important bit when it comes to actually finding out how people not only want to be referred to, but also spoken about, because um, there are variations and nuances between within like every single user group. And there are words that might feel really fitting for some people. Um, some people might hate them. And you also might just get people who don't really mind either way, which is completely natural. People are complex and so are their identities. But by working alongside them, you can really kind of understand what they need out of a product or service and just kind of improve it or um, improve it for everyone. So a good example of this kind of variation is the social model and the first per and the person first model for pe speaking about people with disabilities. This is something that I've like been learning a lot about over the last couple of months because there is like quite subtle um, nuances between the way that each of them work. 
So there's kind of three main models. So um, two of them are like the official ones and then the person first is a bit more um, like woolly. Basically, you've got like person first, the social model and then the medical model. We're not going to talk about the medical model. Medical model is bad. Do not use it. It's not not a very nice way of speaking about people um, because it kind of reduces them down to just very, um, just the medical aspects of them rather than the individual. Um, but the first person model, the person first model I instinctively go to first person because it's like a writing thing isn't it but yes yeah, so the person first model um is basically defined as using language that expectedly puts the person before the disability so this um avoids any implicit judgment in the language that we're using when talking about people so you can see some examples of this between like living with versus suffering from affected by versus victim of and then people with a disability versus the disabled so the, the person first model recommends using words that are both accurate and positive and center the person rather than the disability. Lots of organizations use the person first model, but it's not the only way of doing this. And it was actually pointed out to me earlier this year that the social model was probably better for a lot of, um, lot of organizations. And even though they're kind of similar, the social model is... I think quite like special, it's quite radical, it's quite a good one to be using. So um, this was something that someone from Scope pointed out to me. Um, they describe it best, so I've got a quote for them here. So a lot of organisations use the social model as well, um, and it was something that was created um, by and for um, disabled people, and it was kind of in response to just how archaic the medical model was. So I've got a quote up on the screen here, which is from um, Scope, that says that the social model says that people are disabled by barriers in society, not by their impairment or difference. The social model helps us to recognize barriers and make life harder for disabled people. Removing those barriers is what creates equality. So it's not just the, um, the they need to adapt to us, the world needs to actually just be a better place, which I think is, yeah, just a very good message. So with the social model, it's really forcing us to reconsider the framing of disability within society, because it's looking at both those physical barriers and barriers caused by people's attitudes. So some examples of seeing this in writing is disabled people rather than people with disabilities, deaf people versus a person who is deaf and then like non-disabled rather than able-bodied. And that final one's quite a good example of like the, the able-bodied is not the norm. Um, so when it comes to your own writing, which one should you choose? Um, Cause that's definitely not the medical model. Um, so. Both models are good because they center the personhood and dignity of the individual. There's a lot of overlap in terms of linguistics, um, but the social model is a bit more radical in its approach. And this is because it's really encouraging us to shift our cultural perspective and break down stereotypes. The person first model is a little bit more subtle, but still empowers people using semantics, but it might not go far enough for certain organizations. Um, and the best one, the best way to decide which one to choose is just to ask your users. Probably not specifically because if you ask someone if they want a social model or person first model, it's not really going to mean anything. But you could use some examples of um, how things are phrased and just kind of do a bit of a bit of A B testing or whatever to see which one they prefer. Um, yeah, and that just mean that you can make sure that you're writing in a good way. So you could use both. You could use a mixture, but the main thing is that you're using language in a way that is like dignified, empowering, and doesn't reinforce any um, negative stereotypes. And if you do happen to make a decision around this or do a bit of research about it, it's quite good to um, actually explain like why you've made that choice. Um, there's a really good component in the Gov design system and the Gov.uk design system, which is where my dogs like keeps running around in the corner of my eyes, it's quite distracting. Um, so there's a really good um, component in the Gov.uk design system, which is just that, why are we asking this? So you can basically see a lot or mirror it and just say, like why have we made this decision? Why are we using this language? And then within that, you can just kind of succinctly explain what's led you to that decision and um, like also gather more feedback while you're there as well. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah, you just can gather more feedback and just make sure that you're kind of continuing to improve the service that you're working on. And I think this is something that kind of stands for all inclusive writing decisions. If you're able to kind of create this open dialogue with your users, you can continue to improve the service for them. Um, so now we're going to look at some inclusive writing in practice and um, we can't cover everything, um, but we want to share some be best practice that might help you get started. Um, 
So the first thing to do is pay attention to what your language normalizes. Um, there's a sometimes subtle, not so subtle power in the language we use. Um, and the words that we use can reinforce power or social norms. Examining the language will help us prioritize people over, system, over systems, which leads us to tip number two. Um, avoid using gendered terms. So avoid any language that makes assumptions about people, but a good specific example is gendered terms. Um, you can think about the accidental androcentric example you see in everyday life. So things like mankind, man-made and manpower. Um, and it's okay to be ambiguous if you're better reflecting a broader range of lived experiences. So for example, you could use partner or spouse rather than husband or wife or parents and parenthood rather than mother or father. Um, in a web environment, if you're talking about people, at people, use they or them if you need to speak about them. Uh, it's better to use you anyway, as it's more direct and engaging. Um, you can check how gendered your language is through a platform like Gender Decoder. Um, the link is there. Um, it was actually designed for job ads because uh, there's been some research to show that some job adverts, the way they're written, was appealing to Gen some genders over others because of the language that they were using. Um, but it can be a helpful tool for checking any content. Um, call out specific groups if you want to make them feel welcome. Um, some marginalised groups have historically been excluded and still are excluded, and they may expect this to continue unless you make it explicit that that's not the case. So make sure you make it clear that they're welcome. Uh, content design London used an example of proactively inviting dads to join parenting groups, for example, or stating that trans women could apply for a women's work program. Um, the foreign language effect, you may or may not know about this. I am in my infancy of learning about it, but it's fascinating. Um, research has shown that native languages, uh, in people's native languages, their reactions can be more emotive and instinctual, whereas in a second language, um, their reactions can be more logical and rational. So depending on the decisions you want users to make with your product, you, you might want to consider translation. Um, for example, when I worked at Women's Aid, we had um, a service that was uh, a handbook for people who were in abusive relationships. Um, and this service was translated into many different languages with a lot of positive feedback, particularly from support workers who were working directly with these uh, women who were being abused. Um, and because having it in their own language made them feel especially supportive and it's obviously an extremely heightened emotional state to be going through that. Um, obviously that's a cost and it may not be practical in all instances, but it is something to think about. Um, think about your neurodivergent users. There's loads of general content design good practice that also supports neurodiverse user needs. Um, so things like putting most information, the most important information first at, or at the top of your page can help people avoid missing things further down in case they get distracted along the way. Um, using clear and concise language, uh, people can get information overwhelm if it doesn't get to the point quickly. Um, Lots of people experience that, but it's particularly prevalent um, in the neurodivergent community. Um, using plain English, uh, this avoids assuming something has a different meaning. So some neurodiverse people really struggle with idioms or metaphors or euphemisms, which we'll come on to in a moment. Having clear instructions and steps can really help. Um, don't be afraid to put reminders in your services and repeat things, repeat acronym meanings. Um, this can help people who forget information quickly. Uh, and it's not good practice to assume that your users will remember anything that you've told them. Um, avoiding visual distractions on your page or within your product or app um, can help people stay focused on the task at hand. Um, and make, just make it as easy as possible for people to do what they need to do. So not linking out to other things can be quite a big distraction. Um, you could think about, uh, this is more of a functionality thing, but you could think about auto-filling form boxes um, and things like that, just to make it as easy as possible. Um, this is my favorite tip, if I'm allowed a favorite. 
uh, only ask for information you absolutely need. Um, always ask yourself why you're asking for any personal information in a form. Why did that cinema, for example, need to know my gender? I did actually email them to ask, but they unsurprisingly did not respond. Um, so I'm assuming it's for marketing reasons, but a much better question would have been to ask me what kind of movies I enjoy. Um, don't, yeah, so don't include the question unless you have a really good evidence-based reason to do so. Um, for example, like you probably don't need to know someone's sex unless you're a medical professional. You also probably don't need to know their title. It's unlikely you're going to be writing them some formal letter. And even if you are, you really probably don't need their title. <laughs> Um, if you've established that you really do need this information, then it's, these are some good guidelines to follow. Um, it's best to leave free text boxes if possible so people can self-define. Um, I know for practical data capture reasons, that can be difficult. Um, so if you need to give options, uh, try and do it in alphabetical or numerical order as a minimum um, and include as many options as you can research what these might be because you might not know them all. Um, some examples could be, a lot of my examples are from the queer community because that's my lens, um, but there, there's lots of information online about other examples that might be helpful. Um, so for example, if you need to know someone's sex, you could use female, intersex, male, and prefer not to say as options. You should always have an option for them not to have to answer. Um, for gender, the list would probably be agender, gender fluid, man, non-binary, trans man, trans woman, woman, or my gender isn't listed with a box to specify, and then the prefer not to say option. Um, this list isn't exhaustive and language evolves, so you should keep checking in using current and reliable sources, some of which we have at the end of this presentation. Um, and it might also depend where you are in the world. For example, Two-Spirit could be another option in that gender list, but it's largely used in the Americas by Indigenous folk. Um, it's also really great if you can include an option for people to give their preferred or chosen name. Lots of people's legal names are not the names that they actually go by or want to use. Um, an option for phonetic pronunciation that can be useful. Um, and a pronoun option, if, if at some point you're going to be referring to them in that way, uh, you could, the best one for that is a free text box as for everything, but yeah, include a few options for that if possible. So yeah, as we've seen over the last couple of slides, it's, it's quite easy to see where the language we use can kind of accidentally slip into, um, either upholding unfair power dynamics or reinforcing stereotypes um, or just kind of not including people altogether. So there's a few examples on this slide um, of like better language to use when talking about the world. So um, if you use like migrant rather than expat, expat is a kind of a uniquely white um, European thing that someone is rather than um, a migrant. Um, and then using that like high, middle or low income countries rather than using terms like developing country, third world country, the West, and then um, people living in poverty rather than poor people. So that's kind of that um, going back to that person first social model kind of way of framing people's um, experiences. So one of the things that Hannah's just touched on is about um, limiting our use of euphemisms, idonyms and me metaphors. So these kind of common sayings can be quite confusing for some users. Um, most of them are pretty harmless, um, sometimes like not so much, but um, we often slip into them when we're kind of a bit unsure of what to say, if we're a bit uncomfortable um, with the kind of victory meaning of what we're saying. So, um, for example, there's a lot of euphemisms around um, like death, for instance. So there's like passed away, pushing up daisies. Um, oh, there's loads of them. So the problem with using this kind of language, though, isn't that it's not only confusing for people who are neurodivergent or don't speak English as their first language, um, kind of makes things a lot longer and it makes them more complex. And also it just kind of, new, um, we lose meaning. So we might be trying to conceal or neutralize our language, but in reality, we're just making it more convoluted. But saying all that, if your users are using them, especially in like face-to-face -face services, it's absolutely okay too. I think this is quite a good, um, just rule when it comes to kind of like writing and speaking in general. So um, I did a talk earlier this year um, about like compassionate um, content 
And I spoke about euphemisms for quite a big chunk of the talk. And it was mainly around like discussing difficult topics like death and grief. Um, organizations like Compassion and Dying recommend not using them because they, they kind of reinforce this idea that something taboo has happened. Whereas it was rightly pointed out to me by one of the attendees that um, a lot of people actually find euphemisms comforting when they are in conversation. So I think this really just kind of demonstrates that there aren't really any hard and fast rules when it comes to like everybody's experiences. We may want to kind of like segment our way into something that's kind of consistent and easy. But in reality, people are quite complex and it's OK to break some of those rules if evidence is telling you to. And if there's a way of making it even better for your users, you should listen to them, mirror their language and let them define how they want to be spoken to. That said, if someone's using like quite negative language, don't do that. But generally, um, follow your user's leads, uh, your, your uh, follow your user's lead and um, just talk to them so you can find out what they actually really need from a service. So we've got a few final little inclusive rules to live by um, that we want to kind of leave you with before um, going on to questions and answers. So number one. Uh, right with, not for. So do your research is the main takeaway there. Also, um, don't make assumptions about people's um, experiences, identities or um, anything. Just ask. Um, give people choices, let them self-define. Um, and uh, yeah, well, I guess don't make assumptions about what they want. <laughs> Um, and don't ask for unnecessary information and even the information that is necessary explain why you are especially if people have to go out of their way to find it or it's going to be like emotionally taxing or cumbersome to actually do so let people know why you are and they're more likely to share it with you um it's okay to get it wrong so long as you set it right I think this one's really important because yeah without sounding too cheesy we're all on a gym <laughs> um so we're all learning all the time and it, it is OK to get it wrong. Um, you're, you probably will at some point. I do frequently. Um, but just, uh, yeah, setting it right, apologising, moving forward and uh, getting it right the next time. Um, and then we're just going to end on a quote from Oxfam. We must face these challenges and embrace discomfort to move forward and change the way we work for the better. There is a distinction between being uncomfortable and being unsafe. And um, we've got a couple of resources that we wanted to share with everyone as well. So there's so much like really, really wonderful information online. Um, we've said like um, to take screenshots, but everyone can. Um, and we will be putting this in the YouTube um, description once this um, talk is uploaded. So don't worry about having to write out the really long um, URLs. But yes, yeah, so these are some um, either articles or language guides that we found that um, we refer to quite often. This is not an exhaustive list that we could have had probably about 10, <laughs> 10 um, slides just on this. So this one um, is just some design systems, articles, and just general advice. And then this one is some helpful tools. So there's the gender decoder that we mentioned earlier. Um, readability checklist which is just about making sure everything's in plain English and um, then the web disability simulator so this was shown to me by one of our accessibility consultants I think last year and I think most people in this call will be very much aware of um, like the importance of accessibility but this is really helpful for I think particularly like stakeholder buy-in and building empathy because you can actually just do the extension choose um, whatever um, like web disability you want to include. So a good one is like, um, like ADHD or like dyslexia. That's one that I use quite a lot with um, with like writing. So it's like you get to visually see what it's like for somebody who has got um, dyslexia, like, like engaging with your content. And then also another one for stakeholder buy-in, it's just that how many disabled people will use your website because they might think that it's not that important, but we all know that it is. So yeah, this will all be in the YouTube description. So even if you haven't got it all written down, you'll be able to get access to it later. And yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you both. That was amazing and super insightful. We've had some lovely comments in the chat as well. Everyone seems to have really enjoyed your content. So thank you very much. I particularly loved the commentary about um, just just being a bit more considerate or thinking about the terms that we use a lot that might be problematic, that maybe we didn't know were problematic. Um, 
yeah, really, really, really interesting. We have got a few a few questions, so I'm going to start running through them. I'm just going to remind everybody this talk is being recorded. We will be uploading it to YouTube. All those lovely links that you just saw will be put into the chat, into the um, caption box underneath the video on YouTube. So you'll be able to directly click on them. So don't panic if you didn't manage to screenshot those at the end. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to jump in with a question. So the first one, it actually came up a few different times, was is there a list somewhere that's being updated fairly regularly of all the phrases and terms that have those origins rooted in discrimination or unconscious bias? Um, a lot of people have mentioned they'd love to see a resource like that. Do you know of one? I don't know of one that would be collate, like sort of collated in that thorough way. Um, I, before, for researching this talk, I just Googled it and there was a few articles that came up kind of at the top of Google that had some pretty long lists of stuff. I think probably a lot of them you might already know, but that, you know, those two that I mentioned, long time no see, et cetera, I didn't know that. That was new to me. Um, mm -hmm. I would just I would just have a Google. You might have to do a bit of digging around, but yeah, it, it's not always easy, unfortunately. It's a good resource to have. I think, yeah, there are specific, um, like, like we were saying before about like charities, they'll have like terms within their kind of um their group but yeah maybe that's something that we can all pull ahead together on yeah maybe we can have a thing it's about really hard to manage <laughs> yeah, with the, yeah the maintenance of it I think is the thing yeah. probably why we don't know of one that is like the definitive place yeah but there yeah um, there's loads, loads of information online Okay, so the next one actually is a really good uh, segue from there, which is what are your thoughts on over-reliance on charities to support organizations when they're struggling with resources? Will this pull them away from providing support to their target groups? I think that was to your point, Hannah, around asking charities if you can't afford to go and do research with the users themselves. Yeah, it's it's complicated. And there's I, I guess it probably depends a bit on the size of the charity. So Charities like uh, Scope, uh, Stonewall, etc., already have lots of resources on their websites that you can just access now. Um, so I'd probably start with the bigger charities and see if you could find out what you need to from from resources that are already available. Um, another option is, although you might have no budget, if you have a little bit of budget, if you can offer to pay people for their time to support your work, that's really useful. Um, and and then it's also supporting the charity's aims, but Having worked in several not-for-profits and charities, um, that people who work there are really passionate about what they do and they want to help and they want to make things better for people. So don't be afraid to ask because the, the worst that they can say is, no, I'm sorry, I don't have time for this. But it it's it's not, I don't, no one is bothered by being asked because they want to be there and they want to help. Nice. Okay, the next one is uh, some of the neurodiversity guidance is different and potentially conflicting. Um, so what, what you might do to help with one, you might do slightly differently to help with a different access need. Um, how do you decide who slash which to prioritize if you can't do it one way that's best for everyone? Well, that's such a hard question. <laughs> you can't prioritize. Um, like it, It's not just like a matter of like statistics, like more people are going to have this. I think yeah, I think it's just trying to write for as many people as possible. It's not a matter of like pushing aside certain people. It's just trying to get that kind of like lowest for everybody or the lowest common denominator. But that's a really good question. I might actually have to let more that one over a little bit because it is, yeah, it's something you have to think about in your writing. Um, yeah, it's not a very good answer. I don't know if Hannah's got anything more coherent, but yeah, it's a really good question. <laughs> Generally, the, yeah, like sort of, content design best practice stuff that we talked about in that slide generally most of those things it would be useful actually if, if people have seen conflicting things from that and could give specific examples because I'm not sure what they would be but um generally the the simpler the more, more plain English the lower lower the reading age things like that will help generally more more people I think yeah and even if um things aren't completely perfect but even just doing like the most you can, you're still doing a lot. Um, yeah, content, I think, and also just the way that content design has been set up and all the best practice behind it. So as Hannah yeah. said, it's, it's already making things better for everyone. Um, but, yeah. Nice. 
<clears throat> just adding a, a, an accessibility point there as well as sometimes it's having options for users to interact differently. So giving them the ability to navigate through a page in different ways, or for example, changing color contrast and things like that. All of those things are helping to make um, users have the choice to navigate the way that they need to that's best for them. It's not possible to do that for everything, but that's one way that you can try and help think about different um, needs that might potentially conflict. I don't like the word conflict, but you know what I mean, that they might not be exactly the same way of navigating. But yeah, isn't there isn't a clear answer to that question. It's a really good one, isn't it? I can just see that Michael has put in the chat there an example of having closed captions and subtitles, which could be distracting to people with ADHD or dyslexia or low literacy, which is a really good point. I hadn't thought about that. I guess I I was coming at it from the perspective of designing a web page, probably more than anything, but um, that is a really good point. Um, and I don't have a good answer. <laughs> yeah. So for example, on this call, if any of you are watching closed captions, you have the option to turn them off or turn them on if you need them. So you can kind of customize your experience that way. Uh, okay. I think we've got time for, for one more question. We've got loads. I'm really sorry. I'm not going to get through to everybody, um, but I'm going to do a user research one. Uh, which is any tips on how to avoid making people feel othered when you are including them in research specifically? I think it depends on the kind of research that you're doing and how specific you're being about the user groups you want to test with. So some, so sometimes at Nemensa we'll do user testing specifically with disabled people so we can make sure that we're covering lots of different access needs. Um, but in terms of kind of general research, it, there's no reason why, um, if you're doing research well, there's no reason why the participants should know that you've particularly selected them because they have a particular characteristic, because you won't be asking them about that. You'll be asking them about their experience of the product or service and anything that emerges for them because of how they see the world differently to you should just come out in the research. Um, but I, I suppose probably, it treat people how you want to be treated be kind and empathetic is just always the way to approach research I think okay well thank you Hannah thank you Lauren and thank you everybody for joining us um that was a really interesting session your questions were fantastic we are going to take the rest of the questions away and if there are any that we can um think about informing our own practice we will definitely do that because some of them are really really good so thank you very much so up next uh, today at 1 p.m., don't forget, we have Cornell Hariska Munn, who's going to be talking about the importance of internal inclusive workplaces uh, and how necessary they are in any kind of accessibility and inclusion agenda. So uh, we hope to see you later on at one o'clock. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. And bye for now. Hey, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.